Welcome everybody, thanks for coming on tonight. Uh, should be a really good event tonight. Lots to Lots of great presentations here. Um, looking forward to this one. Um, a few things I need to do the formal. I always forget to do the formal announcements. The formal announcements things are: there's a fire, your exits are there and there. Run the screaming as you go. It's always entertaining, but there's no there's no fire alarms planned for tonight, so hopefully we won't get that to happen. Um, the format for tonight: we've got a couple of speakers, but I'll go through the presentation here, which is the easiest way to probably. Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about tonight. I can use the laser thing and try not to take anybody's eye out. Um, so our main event is how can modern methods of construction help to help us to build back better? Not easy to say, but a really important issue. Um, we then got some Q&A at the end of that session. We've got some things about coming soon. Awards recap, a bit of revelation about, about what we did. And the after party as usual. So I'm going to quickly skip through our agenda. I always do this. I keep meaning to put some comedy faces in here to see if anyone notices the difference. They probably won't. Or some moustaches on people who haven't got them and some... And some hair on people who haven't got any, that would be good. Um, just to get to, these are the people who make these events happen, so thanks to those guys who, who engage, engage in the committee. I should say at this point, we did have a, had a committee meeting uh, the other week as a, sort of, a sort of brainstorming session to try and understand what we do for the next year. Really good session, lots of feedback, lots of commentary on the awards, which I'll come back to later on, but lots of thought about what we're going to do for the next year's programme. So we start to think about these things a long way in advance and uh, start to think about what sort of topics we might wish to do. We're surely going to issue out a survey monkey survey for those of you who get those things as your member organisations. If you could take the time to fill out those, they're really important for us to understand. We want to give you the kind of uh, lecture programme that you want to be involved in. So we couldn't take the time, couldn't make the effort to share those around those people who come from your organisations and make sure they feed that back. That would be great. So those will come shortly. We're also doing some work on those. Thank you, Rob, for doing that. Um, so those will come, come shortly to do any effort. Um, so this is who construction sections are. This is the glorious range of graphic designs been done by those companies who are involved in here. There are probably a probably couple not on you there, but it starts to show a really good group of companies that are involved in Norfolk Construction Action. It's really nice to see so many people here. A couple of new people uh, this month, we've got Anstey Horn, who are uh, specialist consultants involved with right, rights and light and all things building consultancy. Do you know anybody here from Anstey Horn tonight? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're taking their membership seriously on event one. That's really good. And Adrian James Acoustics, I'm sure you'll know. Let's. Is anybody here from Adrian James? Well done, the man in the room. Sorry, what's your name? Andy. Do you want to have 20 seconds on how brilliant Adrian James Acoustics really are? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you're the, you're the premium acoustics engineers in the local to Norwich area. Great competition. Well. It's a really good market space. So thank you for joining the organisation. Really good to see you tonight. Okay, here we go. Um, so here was the main event. So as I stumbled on earlier on, how can modern methods of construction help us to build back better? This evening we're joined by Paul Lynch from Better Delivery. I can say lots about Paul, but Paul will say lots about himself, um, and he explains better what he does than anybody does. Needless to say, he's an expert in the world of, of modern methods of construction. And Andrew Savage, uh, the man who delivers those sorts of things in reality, particularly around the Norfolk area worked a lot with Andrew over the years, and he is the man I think who's doing, I would arguably say, the most as far as a sustainable approach to building housing in, in the area. So delighted to have both of you here um, talking tonight. Paul, thank you for sponsoring this evening's event. So those of you who've got a slightly full tummy now and feeling pretty replete, it's down to Paul's wife that you've done that, so thank you Paul for sponsoring, well done. Um, and with that, I will pass across to Paul, who's going to start. I have done some notes, because I, uh, I did an event recently at this Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire Construction Excellence, and I got told off by the lady running the event for talking too much. Um, <laughs> we were on a panel of about four people, and it was an hour session, and I think I filled 55 minutes. So um, forgive me, I have done notes because I really want to stick to my presentation. Paul, if you get to an hour, I will tell you to stop. <laughs> um, I have timed it to 25 minutes. Okay. So, um, but I, I suppose the thing that I'd, I'd explain is I, I work all over the UK, North born and bred. Um, I won't go into too much of that, but when I started in off-site uh, construction, um, I started working with Andrew, strangely enough. Um, I'm going to say some nice things about Andrew, but generally because they're true. When we talk about off-site and various MMC methods, a lot of it is about collaboration. Andrew's probably one of the most collaborative person I've ever worked with, and a lot of what I learn is all down to him. So he's not going to say anything nasty about me when he follows all his presentation. <laughs> not anymore, anyway. <laughs> um, so in, in, in my time, I've done uh, probably around 17,000 homes, predominantly mostly affordable, um, all over the UK. Uh, the consultancy, which I'll tell you a little bit about, we're effectively, if you like, we're, we're a new breed. 
specialist consultancy, um, kind of looking at better ways of doing things. But the reality is most clients don't understand that. So we have a cost consultancy bit because clients understand what it is when you're a PM or a PMQS or a employees agent. So therefore we have those traditional bits because then clients can go up on the MMC bit. Ironically, lots of our competitors, particularly the big consultants in, in London, have gone the other way where they've gone, we need someone from MMC, so we're going to get ourselves an expert. And generally they were an MD at some modular company that's gone bust, quite a few do happen. And, uh, and they go, oh, we'll get this person as an expert. When I start to talk to you about offsite consultancy, it's such a broad, broad spectrum. You can't just like put it into one area. So in, in our consultancy, we specialise. So I specialise predominantly in panelised. We've got people who understand development better than me, and funding models, and procurement, and therefore the reality is there's these things that make it work or fail. Um, I'd also say that a lot of this is about Really, when you start to talk modern methods as people use it, it's about digital technology, it's about lots of new things that are coming to the forefront. So again, I'm clearly not techie, <laughs> and the reality is, but I'm working on a, on a platform, to, um, digital platform at the moment for DFE, but only because the designer that does it doesn't understand how to build skills, so therefore you kind of work in, in, in that collaborative way. So. <coughs> That's really where we come from, but as I said, the, the consultancy has expertise in manufacturing construction technology. And as, as I said, with Andrew, I think we probably built somewhere like 600 homes together when I worked for one particular company, and that worked well because we just rinsed and repeat and did the same thing. Where it's quite challenging with clients that we go and meet is they want to do a pilot, and you try and explain to the client, you know, building two or three houses will teach you nothing about how you're going to deliver 100. And the reality is, uh, years ago I did a regular presentation called Drop the Pilot, because really and truthfully it doesn't teach you a great deal. Really and truthfully, when we start to talk about things, uh, we need to stop really some of the narrow focus that people have. We need to focus on processes, not building systems. That may sound a bit odd when we talk about MMC. And the reality is, as a, as a consultancy, we've got that they were on 450 manufacturers in the UK, and that's not complete. But the reality is you do need to know those things, but you need to focus on the outcomes as opposed to, um, as opposed to a lot of the things that people talk about. We'll get a lot of clients will come to us and go, we've decided we're going to do modular on this project. And my response is normally, okay, that's the answer, what's the question? The reality is, MMC is, is and I'll say it regularly, it's not really a thing. So um, today I'm going to be covering uh, the categories. If you haven't seen them before, I'm not going to go through them. They're available online. You can find out about them. I'm happy to tell you, but it's dull. <laughs> but the reality is it's a useful, it's a useful process. Um, but again, we'll come back to discussing how we're going to build. That's really the key thing. And try to understand what we're trying to achieve and define the desired outcomes. So when we start to talk about those things, it could be more... But it's less about MMC and it's more about social value, whole life costing, uh, sustainability and carbon targets. Uh, we did some work on a school that Carter's built out at Fakenham and really to try and understand the amount of carbon that's in that. Interestingly, the traditional construction was meant to be much worse than the light gauge steel frame panelised system. And when we measured it, it was almost the same. Now, the marketing from those light steel companies was, it will be a lot better, it will save you a lot. The issue is, is when you start to understand where the carbon occurs, it's before it gets to the UK. So the reality is a lot of the stuff that they say is misleading, but they're trying to sell something. So we need to move away from what people are trying to sell and start to work out what we want. It's not to say that that's a bad system, but if you take the base of that school, it's 226 tonnes of carbon for traditional construction in the structure, the light gauge steel was 219 tonnes, so not the saving they reckoned it was where they said 70% saving, clearly not that. <coughs> In actual fact, the timber frame closed panel system was about 128 tonnes, so considerable saving. It's interesting where it is, the devil's in the detail, as we'd say. Um, and then beyond that, regulatory environments compliance. I, I'm not a fire consultant, but I spend most of my life talking about fire and combustibility. Um, and and in, in off-site, it's, it's an important factor. Bizarrely enough, most clients and most manufacturers don't really understand what they need to be known. 
Um, and this will really rule us. So as we go through this process with clients, we're trying to rule stuff out, not rule it in. So we don't start off with the answer. So lots of projects will come, turn up and the architect will go, we started working with this company. Okay, how did you meet them? We worked on them with the project before. Was it the same? No, it's different. Or I met this guy down the pub and he seemed really nice. So the reality is we don't need to stumble across these things. They do need to be selected properly. <coughs> also as well, I will say, I'm not evangelistic about MMC. I'm passionate, but I won't tell you it works everywhere because it clearly doesn't. It's an enabler. It can help from some <coughs> positive change, get better outcomes. But it's not an outcome in its own right. And that's what people have to start make, making understanding. There is too much attached to it. Um, and we need to look at that. <coughs> and then basically we'll understand how we can work uh, beyond MMC. So these are the seven categories. As I said to you, I'm not going to go through each, each of the categories. Um, but basically, they were designed to create physical types of MMC being used. Because basically, people don't understand. So if I give you an example, if modular construction's here, traditional construction here, panelised or category two is here. So there's a massive chasm between some types of off-site construction. And I think that is quite an important thing. So some things work really well and other things don't, and that's just working out what you're trying to achieve from that. Um, the other thing I'd say is defining the building systems and technologies is what this framework's all about, and it does help clients. And to be honest with you, if any of you have seen the DFMA overlay, so sorry, if I start using terms, please someone raise it. So DFMA is Design for Manufacturing Assembly, PDFMA is Platform Design for Manufacturing Assembly, um, <coughs> but the, in that Reber overlay, it references MMC advisors. So that can be an architect, it can be someone who understands, it can be an informed client, but generally it's, it's consultancies like us. Um, and, and we do this by really starting to go through what the client's requirements are. Trying to front load key decision making to avoid unnecessary client change. Um, if you look at where, if you want my opinion on what the future of MMC is, it's component led. So it's not modular, it's not panelised, it's using components from different elements and being brought together. And that assembler, if you like, is probably going to be main contractors. It's not going to be off-site companies. It's, I'll talk a little bit about legal in general if you want to talk about it, but the reality is, is some of those things won't work because we're not enabling them to work, so you have to work through a different process. And if you look at automotive and rail and aerospace, everyone lo loves to refer to those industries, but they're all component-led. So the reality is it's a case of someone assembling them. Um, and also as well, just try and remember, all materials are made in a factory. So every building material on site is generally made in a factory. All we're talking about with off-site construction or MMC is the scale and the scope. So the reality is it can be whatever you want it to be, but the reality is the bigger the scale and the scope, the value can help the project if aligned correctly. And also as well, the thing is that we're feeding into basically what the government's presumption in favour of offsite is. Uh, as a consultancy, we've been working on their latest playbook, which is about platform design. And the reality is there'll be something after this and as they continue to try and push. <clears throat> So, basically, um, I'm sure probably some of you, I don't need to explain to you, again, the government drive on this and what they're trying to do. And there are lots of reasons for it, but the reality is there are frameworks that I've worked on in schools, hospitals and housing. You only have to look at probably the DFE, they're probably one of the most uh, successful frameworks, as they term it. They've delivered lots of projects. It works. Um, and they've understood a lot about MMC. Once upon a time, the only way for them was modular, but that was only because they couldn't get contractors to what they wanted to do. Now they're back to contractors with kit of parts. So the reality is it's all cyclical. We'll all go through it. MOD at the moment have started to do quite a lot. MOJ has started to do a lot. Those frameworks push because government wants it pushed. Um, <clears throat> so where are we on the journey? Uh, first thing I'd say to you is don't believe when you read about MMC and off-site construction in the press. Generally it's written by people who do not understand it. 
Um, the devil's in the detail. Um, pretty much some of the big things that have been in the press recently. Um, it, it, it's complicated. It's not what people think it is. Uh, and, and lots of people have asked me to talk about uh, failure rates in, in MMC and off-site construction. The reality is, is MMC is not that different to uh, main contractors and developers. The reality is failures affect everyone and ultimately the supply chain is in effect. So the reality is if you've got an off-site provider not making lots of money and a couple of their clients go and take the money, then ultimately they won't survive. Um, if, you talk, if you want to talk about something like League and the General, and I can't talk too much in detail because we've written reports for them and various other things, but if you just go back and look at the statistics, so the reality is when they set up their business, they said um, basically that they wanted a certain size of the market. So if you looked at the latest quarterly statistics, I had to write these down, but from April to June, there are about 54,900 dwelling completed in the UK. LNG wanted 1.3% of the entire market. So whoever wrote their business plan kind of really didn't understand it. And then if you, if you relate that back to category one or the volumetric side, they've only got 1.6% of the market, so they basically want the entire market for, for modular. So it's, it's not the reality of it. And also as well, there are things where uh, I've worked with lots of venture capitalist businesses that <coughs> want to go into offsite and volumetric because they think they're going to make a load of money out of them. They're going to turn that profit in three to five years. I would suspect most of them will lose their money in that three to five years. It's not that straightforward. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but the reality is it takes a long while and unfortunately history is dotted with people who didn't make it work. Um, but the reality is, is category one in housing are these two things that probably aren't terribly aligned in my opinion. But if you look at category two, which is panelised construction, and you look at other things, the barriers to entry are lower. So I often say to people, if you want to set up a timber frame factory, two men and a dog in a garage, dog's in charge, you can make some good stuff. But the reality is it's about keeping it simple. And local works really well. Suddenly when you're going, I'm going to build this super factory in, I don't know, Corby, then the reality is you aren't going to cover the entire UK. It's much, you'll be much more successful building a factory in Norwich and trying to deliver those elements and, and delivering that wide. Uh, <clears throat> so I suppose the reality is everyone wants to know what's holding us back and the reality is prefabrication makes sense. Um, it's not a UK thing. Everyone in the world is wrestling with the same issues that we have and they're coming to the same conclusions. So the reality is where we may be on the off-site road and and what prefabrication offers to us today, it will be different and it will work to some degree, but it's not a one size fits all. So as an example, I, I said to you look at category two, so panelised, you can look at category five and category seven, but category one in housing just really isn't gonna work, but it will probably work in healthcare. And I've worked on lots of projects. It will probably work in some parts of the MOG, MOD, MOJ frameworks. But you can't just go, oh, I can put this in there and it will work. Um, and I, I'd also say as well, when you start to talk to house builders, even if they do like prefabrication, none of them want modular and category one. That's consistent, consistently what they all say. And when I say category one, I mean full off-site modular because it's too restrictive. The reality is if you've got a wide range of house types on one side, it doesn't work in that way. You can't just assume this and... Um, some of you are probably familiar with planning, but the reality is they don't often like it all looking the same, which does kind of go against the standardisation that modular companies want to apply. But the reality is also as well, when we look at what frustrates any factory production, and that is tinkering. So whether it is uh, building design, cost consultants, local authorities, planners, building control, the reality is we need something called frozen design. And the reality is some systems, if they don't need certain bits frozen, so example, it's how to get M&E frozen. So therefore, don't do M&E off-site. If you are going to do it, then freeze it. And the reality is these things are quite important things. So you can often get the structure frozen quite easily. We can adapt the design in panelised at stage four. But 
and even after. But the reality is, if you do a modular, you need to start way before stage three. So the reality is, those things affect procurement, and they affect where we get to. And I would also say that late changes, and I'm sure none of this will be rocket science for you, but it erodes the strategic ambition for increased levels of standardisation and to improve the efficiency and quality of delivery, and whether that's off-site or, or traditional. So, so again, I'm not really going to do too much on the on the traditional understanding of why why we use MMC and what the thing is. What I'd say about factory production is it's not necessarily better, it's different. And it's the differences that you can harness to utilise. So I'm going to pick on a few things. So let's take waste. Uh, anyone in the waste industry? Anyone focused on waste? Excellent, okay. Um, I'll try and keep, if I stray off point, pick me up. But the reality is waste is a big emitter of carbon. So the reality at some point we're going to start focusing on waste and, and carbon. But the reality is what 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 is it with waste in factories? Factories aren't good at dealing with waste. Factories are good at dealing with leftover materials. So what they do is they stew those leftover materials down into pots and they're deliberately trying to get rid of them because of cost. Not because they want zero waste, because they see it as a cost. So as an example, if you've got a timber frame factory and you go around most of them, and have a big shipping container full of one type of sawdust and a big shipping container full of another type of sawdust. One sawdust will be untreated and they sell that for animal bedding, wood pellets, because there's no treatment in it. The one with treatment in, they try not to have different types of treatment so that then they know exactly what that treatment is and then they can go and sell it to someone making chipboard because they can say it's this N5Q1 preservative so then they can deal with it and they can make a product they'll buy all, all sorts of waste products, um, packaging, tape, all those things, but they'll stick to the same suppliers, not because just of ease, because then they can sell those bales of, of product on. So again, factories have that luxury. You can't do that on site. You can't have 1,500 skips segregating stuff in. And also as well, the myth that off-site, on-site construction, sorry, sends this stuff to, to, to uh, recycling, because it gets to the recycling centre and someone says, oh, you shouldn't have that piece in there, right? Bypass recycling and go straight to landfill. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is it's contamination. And, and that's, we're all aware of that. So improved safety. People talk about this all the time in factories. The reason is, is because when you're on a site, you're up here. And when you're on a factory, your platform is here. So if you're going to fall, you're going to fall that level. Yes, you might have nail guns or fixings and stuff like that, and they can hurt if you stick them in your leg. But the truth of the matter is, factories are not innovative places. People follow a process, and, and that's what makes factories good. People don't need to think for themselves because they have a piece of paper. That's what is attractive to lots of people. So therefore, they don't go around going, oh, I'll go and nail this on here. They do what they tend to be told to do, and they have a supervisor to do it. So that's why factories can be safe because also as well people are really focused on, on the health and safety factor but again not because they're trying to achieve a good standard just because of the effect on the factory. Then you look at consistent delivery and on time and budgets people talk about this all the time and that's because factories are sausage machines when something goes out the door they want something else to go along the production line you plan that you move that along so again you start to see a pattern here where factories do stuff not because they want to be clever they want to be better it's just because that's what all factories do, whether they're making widgets or coffee cups or anything. This is what factories do. And the reality is other effects you know, um, sort of tend to come from those things. But again, none of these advantages are specific to one off-site system. So when someone tells you we're better at delivering zero carbon, you know, most of them can deliver zero carbon because the reality is they understand certain elements. But there are some things that they can't achieve. And also, as well, when you talk about factories, they will attract greater diversity. The reality is, and again, this is not off-site, this is not construction. Factories are simpler places to work. You ultimately, if you're from an ethnic background and you haven't got the qualifications to work on a building site, you're overqualified probably to work in a factory. And the reality is, is these things are just not what people tend to think. And if you think back to the... Um, certainly to some, some of the conflicts that we've had in World War II, World War I, 
lots of ladies who never worked in factories went and worked in factories. And it wasn't a difficult place and a difficult adaption. But the reality is you will find, and I've worked in lots of factories and for companies that have done it, a real mix of people. And it's just not like the general construction industry. So, um, so this case study is Hannam Hall. I worked on this. Uh, ironically, it's exactly the same system that I used with Andrew on 90% of the projects. Uh, it's not rocket science, and it's certainly not space age materials, it's straightforward thermal performance, and it's again not really cutting edge technology. But this scheme is called Hannah Hall, it's in Bristol, it zero carbon or code for sustainable homes level six. And for Barrett's, it was unique, so it's 2015. Most people in Barrett's don't know anything about this project. Um, it was one bedroom apartment right up to five bedroom houses. Uh, there was a grade two listed building in the middle of this site. Um, what was interesting, and a lot of people don't know this, is they did a lot of energy and environmental monitoring. And that, that equipment was placed in 10 properties out of the 185 that were there. And ironically, only about two years ago, all that monitoring should have come to the end of its life and they should be using it. God knows where that is. <laughs> but somewhere out there, there's loads of really useful information about how to live in a zero carbon house and how to reduce your energy bills down to near nothing. But, I mean, would we want that today? Is that useful? Uh, I, I would like to see it. But that interesting information that they've created and the accuracy of it would be interesting to know how well it compared to what they predicted it would be. So we did lots of co-heating testing when we finished these units. And again, the U value is 0.11, air tightness around about one, so Tupperware, if you like, MVHR systems. And they have had testing in 10 of them for more than eight years now. So, um, but occupancy satisfaction is certainly an important thing. And the reality is, is it would be good if they actually used and we had some of that information. And, and there's a local scheme, not on the same scale that we did, which was Trinity Close at Rackheath, again, zero carbon, uh, Circle Angler, I think I worked on with that. That was back in 2011. Uh, I think um, UEA did the monitoring and stuff like that. So again, there is data there, and ironically, I'll take you on to this project. So fast forward to 2020, this is a project I worked on in Kent, and so the local authority down in Kent, <coughs> no one here from Kent, I take it, good, so I'll continue. <laughs> so the local authority said, we want this zero carbon. So um, the architect, really the design wasn't focused on zero carbon, wasn't focused on MMC, it was focused on building rigs, and I guess to get a planning result. So the reality is they built these, the viability didn't work, I was involved with a sustainability consultant and ultimately this scheme started off at the similar sort of fabric to Ham Hall and lots of other schemes I've worked on but it ended up pretty close to building rigs and allegedly it's still zero carbon. So the fabric has been diluted so much and it's ultimately because the local authority didn't know how to measure it or what they were asking for. So the reality is, ironically, all these years have passed and we have no lots but ultimately we're still trying to uh, get what we need to work. And this is a mile apart from Han Hall and it's now being built. Um, so um, I suppose the takeaways for me, um, the world uses factories and the reason they use factories are because they're well-managed processes, robust controls machine. The reality is that's what makes factories work well, repeatable, processes that go through. It doesn't mean everything has to look the same, but then when we look to things like the building safety uh, bill, it's asking us to do more construction safer, more closely controlled factory-like conditions. DFMA generally improves both safety and, and uh, certain construction and quality, or it can do. It closes those gaps, and it's not because factories are good at it, it's because the reality is you haven't got someone making a decision on site as to how that's going to look or how it's going to be put together. You've got someone in a factory, probably 100 miles away, looking at a piece of paper saying, it tells me to do this, so I do this. And, and the reality is, is factories 
and this is whatever the sector is, whether it's coffee cups or car wheels or whatever, to focus on productivity, labour, processes, material efficiency is one of the big things, in-use performance, information management, risk management. And to be honest with you, when it's done optimally with DFMA and MMC, uh, particularly when you've got a digital enabled process, you can get those same benefits. And if you wonder if we need those benefits, uh, the construction industry is faced with challenges like the rest of the world around our climate, air quality, biodiversity, natural habitats, availability, natural resources and materials, population size, urbanisation, housing provision and infrastructure capacity. So those two things are married up. So it's not a surprise that the world is looking to off-site or MMC or whatever you want to call it. I will say MMC is not a thing although I've probably talked about it as a thing. It's a process, it's not a product. And while DFMA will not alter the fundamentals of good design and production, but it's about getting the best possible outcomes. And I suppose the reality is for clients and communities, there is a way of harnessing it, but it can be done badly. Uh, I will say it's a myth that DFMA is a barrier to great architecture because I showed you Hannah Hall. That was very cost effective, very, very efficient, and to be honest with you, I'd love to live in one of those, and I've never said that about Barrett House in my life. Mm -hmm. So the reality is it's not always what you tend to think. Um, but there are some things that we're trying to do to generate the off-site construction world. PMV, does anyone know what PMV is? There we go. So do you know how we get to PMV? I won't put you on the spot, so. So basically it's a metric that measures the proportion of construction that happens off-site. And the reality is it's one of the most clumsy and nasty metrics I ever worked with. Because more PMV is not a good thing. Base Homes England funding is attached to it. Uh, DFE is attached to it. I think they want 70% MMC. I sat with a client the other day and he said, we're at 70%. We want to have a target of 85%. And I went, no, this is a really bad idea. We will not get what you want. But... When we start to look at, does anyone know what vertical integration is? That's why um, legal and general bore factory. They want vertical integration. Vertical integration, huge upfront up cost for any house builder. When you try and do it as a modular builder, it's worse because those upfront costs are even bigger. You need to feed that machine. You need steady, reliable workflow. And without the economies of scale modular, it just doesn't work. And we've got two things in construction. So I, I always use this term, we have production and we have construction. They're diametrically opposed and it's very difficult to match the things together. You're either focused on one or the other. And the reality is, when we're talking about construction, we talk absorption rates. When we're talking about production, we're talking about production capacity. So every factory has a glass ceiling. You want to get to the glass ceiling. You know when you're at the glass ceiling because your hair starts to press down. That's how you know when you're at capacity. But Absorption rates tend to mess up that because the reality is you want to turn on and off. So that's why components work. Um, and I would just lastly say this is about closing gaps in production, thermal performance, all sorts of different things. And optimization and modern methods, if you like, um, they can help. But it's not all about boxes on the back of trucks. It's not always about panels. Pods can work. But in some places, you'll find something called unitised facades. You won't see them outside of London, but they work really well in London. And it's an off-site process. You know? And you all have seen them probably going down the M11. Someone's balcony and a balustrade and everything all together, and it'll be craned up into a building. But it will work in London. It might work in Manchester or Birmingham. It'll never work in Norwich. So the reality is this thing is not a geographical equal level plan for it. And that's it. Well, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, and, and thank you very much for asking. What oh, is a face I know? Uh, we talked about yeah modular factories at IOD, didn't we? That's what I shouted about. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, just um, thank you very much indeed. Anyway, for letting me come. Um, what we're going to talk about is is the client's perspective. Um, why did we choose MMC for certain projects? What didn't work in challenges? And there's a few case studies thrown in as well. Um, this is really weird not being able to see it on here. Um, I just thought I'd just, I'm missing a slide, John. <laughs> there you go. 
There we go. Um, this was the last time I presented externally, which was 2017, which I can't quite believe. If anybody knows me, that was a rarity, but that's because we've been a little busy. But um, I was here with Bryn Maidman, well, actually at UEA, and we were discussing the pros and cons of modular after uh, Mr. Farmer and modernize or die. And it was a really interesting evening. Bryn was doing, uh, I think, against, I think, was he or for? I was doing whatever. And we sort of come to it, and it was a really good discussion point. So I'm hoping I can get through this quickly. And there's a discussion at the end of it, I hope, because it is, it's really, and has, have things moved on from 2016 17, which is quite interesting? And has the construction industry moved on from 2016 2017? I don't think we've moved on from since 2004, I'll be bluntly honest with you. But um, it's an interesting subject. And, and the subject at the bottom of this is our ageing workforce. That's, uh, that's one of the, the issues we've got. Now, Uncertainty, should it get in the way? And um, Paul very kindly sort of talked about legal in general, but it's gone beyond legal in general. There, there's companies all over the place that you've heard in the press, including a housing association, which is what we are. <coughs> and basically, Swan Housing, at the end of last year, went bust. And housing associations don't go bust. You know, we don't. We get um, soaked tight by somebody else. We shouldn't go bust. We're asset rich. We've got income coming in, and they went bust because they set up a modular factory. So when you talk about social value and investment, you can see what has happened to a very large housing association down in Essex. They had certainty, supposedly, because they had their own sites. So when you hear that word certainty as well in, in production, we need that certainty through the factory. They had that, but still went bust. So another housing associations had to come up and swallow it up. Factories are shut, and they will um, start trying to rebuild that organisation. But we had a whole load of tenants in that organisation, and they're the people that were paying for that factory. So it's really interesting where that investment goes. Um, <coughs> maybe this is partly a discussion at the end, but uh, these are the companies, and they go on and on. I put Homes England in there because their investment goes into all of the stuff. So we don't hear about Homes England writing off their investment either, which is basically the government. And I must admit, I have to be very nice to them, so please don't let this um, go out anyway. Um, steady demand, that's what it's like. It's unlikely to come from an unstable, pro-cyclical, for sale market, forget what we do, and a construction business model based on passing down risk. That's, that's basically it. And house building factories are major capital commitments that rely on steady and predictable demand for their products. This has been in the press. These are statements that have been written by journalists. If they know what they're on about or not, I think that's, I, I can read into that. And is it about time, this is just for me, modern is forgotten about, when we have a book of methods of construction? We talk about MMC, but it's actually choosing the right frame for what you're doing in my book. So the work we do is driven by affordable housing delivery. We're made up of three companies. I thought I'd better do it very quickly. Born and Housing Association, we started in Norwich, 60, 1963. We've got 5,600 houses now that we've built or we've bought right across Norfolk. We go from Sutton Bridge to Lowestoft. Born and St. Benedict started in 2006. It's our open market company. We turn over between six and 12 million a year, depending on what we do. And that supports Fallen Housing Association. So we've made a profit out of that every year since it started. And that goes into the Housing Association to help deliver more affordable housing, which is pretty cool. And also net zero carbon now. So all the zero carbon stuff is coming out of the profits are going straight back. The great thing about this is that's a charity. That's a limited company. We don't pay tax. We use gift aid. <laughs> so super. Board of Development Services is uh, uh, who I'm employed by. Alex is in the audience. We're employed by this. We're jointly employed by Board and Housing Association and Development Services, and that basically procures all our construction and also gets our VAT back. It's a very tax orientated thing that you can hear. Okay, so what drives our decision making? Well, our corporate strategy is what we believe in. So corporate strategy gets done every three, four years. We have a board, chair, non-execs. They decide what we're going to do, in essence. I put forward, this is what we're going to do. So what we've done here in this corporate strategy, that's a real big buy-in. And I've got three separate boards to get buy-in, development services, which luckily I'm on. Uh, St. Benedict's was the market, which is interesting. Do we come away from uh, brick and block? for our market housing, that's been an interesting discussion. And also the housing association, which is the big one, that's the, that's the asset owner. 
So uh, we've, in that corporate strategy, we don't necessarily talk about construction methods, but we talk about what we believe in, what drives us. So we've had cost of heat, how you heat your house. That's one of our drivers. The other driver we've got, we've moved away from EPCs, we don't believe in them, and we've gone carbon. That's sitting in our corporate strategy now. Because actually building regs has got us to an EPC level anyway, so why talk about it? So it's actually what we're going to do with operational embodied. Whenever I see net zero, I think what you're meaning. You know, we're talking about operational at the moment and we're working on embodied, I'll be honest with you. We've got a long way to go. But um, operational, I'll show you a project in a minute. Um, and then from that, we make this decision. What is that frame strategy to fit the project? And every project, Alex, myself, Ed, who's in my team as well, we will sit down with our consultants and actually say, what are we using? Where are we going with this to fit that strategy? I don't think, if you don't know your strategy, you don't know your frame in my book. So that's where I've driven this since 2003 when I joined Broadland. So the Broadland journey in all this, we've gone full circle. <laughs> I don't know what all these icon means, they just came up and Alex took the mickey out of me when I showed him this the other day. So what does two eyelashes mean gone full circle? I do not know. But anyway, there we are. Maybe the circle's fallen over. But anyway, I think we've gone full circle. Um, we started off showing the moment with the case studies. I, when I joined, we were brick and block all the way through. Design was interesting. We had our prickly bushes, we had our coloured front doors, we had all the bits that you would expect from affordable housing of that time. Um, so we've had a sort of design out, but in, in terms of frame, it was brick and block all the way. It, that's what I inherited when I came in. Um, we've probably gone full circle a little bit through that. We went back to brick and block, we've gone away again, we're now timber frame. We're, you know, we've done a bit of everything all in there. And, and I think it's, we forget, the construction industry is very clever at forgetting what it's done on the last project. And we forget, and we've stopped forgetting now. Because um, I'll tell you, I had a hammock moment in lockdown one. And we've stopped forgetting what we've done before, and we are reflecting on it now. But it's very easy to forget. So cost of heat replaced with cost of energy. Because the cost of heat bit is actually sorted in terms of building rooms. Yeah, Phil, lovely to see you. No, no, it's fine. Your point, no, it's fine. Phil, the toilet's just behind me. That's fine. Um, it's replaced with cost of energy, and we're having to deal with that. Carbon's back, because <laughs> it was here in 2016, if anybody remembers that. We were all ready to go, and then it got pulled. So that's what I mean. We could have done it then, and we didn't. We went back to design. So we completely, another strategy completely took over. Local investment is really important. That's why we're using Bitcoin. But local investment <laughs> is really, really important. That was Alex's joke, I had to get it. Um, and uh, our funding environment is really interesting as well. We've got Homes England over here, which we can get money for affordable housing over here. A certain amount of money, not all of it. You'll be surprised to hear. Um, that's why we need Paul and St. Benedict's to uh, get the gap. And then we've got our capital funding coming from any bank that you would operate with. Uh, we will operate with anybody that will give us money, basically, as long as that it's, it's, it's... Actually, we've got HMRC coming for money laundering, so I don't know why that is. <laughs> is that funding? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, um, so that funding environment is interesting because the funding environment over here, the capital banks and insurance and the warranty markets are really worried so that even about stick frame. They, they, they don't want us to have too many of them in our stock, which gives me a problem, really. It's really odd even though you can get cheaper funding to go low carbon. But they're actually worried about the bit that's holding the house up. So that's really interesting. Homes England, of course, are driving you to the biggest modular market ever. You know, they want, that's what they want. They want us all at that number one or whichever number it is. Um, they want it at number one. Um, and so uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting thing for us in, in the way that we're funding. And then we've got Boris and Benedict's. What does, the market customer think, and we've got shared ownership in the housing association, what does that customer think in buying their house? What, what do they actually think of timber frame? So we've got all that going on with the funding environment. And then, of course, we get to the correct frame for the project. So this is the case studies, you'll be pleased to hear, I will speed up. Um, 2006 I've gone from, all the way up to 2024. Uh, I know we're not there yet, but that's when that one completes. And then I'll talk about going beyond. But there is a journey in here, and you'll have to stay with it. 
with me, and I've actually, oh no, I have to put it all in the journey, that's all right, okay. So, Elizabeth Fry Road, Gould Road, this is a Norwich City Council project many years ago. Um, they put it out, Concrete Homes, if anybody knows that, in South Norwich. Um, this is all the concrete homes that got knocked down and rebuilt. Um, we were really early adopters. I had to do it quickly, that's one of the, I must say, we were under, a, under the cosh with funding. And Broadland was in a situation where we needed some help as well at the time. So we were in a, a real weird situation and I needed something very quickly. And I don't like pilots anyway, but we did pilot 10 houses up in Trunch using sit panels from Kingspan. Kingspan sit panels, nice and easy. And, uh, and actually it went so well, we then built 179 houses with it and that's what it should have been used for in the first place. Really. The 10 worked, but they were pretty standard all the way through. There was two apartment blocks. John Young's at the time, uh, it was Tony Tan actually at John Young's at the time. We got accredited by Kingspan, so they got all their accreditations and, and we did a whole load of training. It felt like super fast speed in those days. It really felt like it. They're still performing, they're really performing. You look at the cost of heat and it is minimal. That SIP panel is still performing, which is incredible in 2000, that was 2006, wasn't it? Um, but we've got signs of damp and mould, mainly in the bathroom areas in some of it. And we don't, know, we don't know if that's just the construction or what's happening with our barn. We're going to sort it out. But there is signs of things going on. And that could be just that the atmosphere is going a little bit differently, whatever it is. But we got not, a, not it's not great all the way through, but there is a little bit of signs of it, which people are talking about that. So could our ventilation at the time be a bit more robust? I don't know. Um, but it's European supply, even local contractor, but it was European supply. Because even though Kingspan said they came and were built in Hull. They were built in a very strange factory in eastern Germany, and that's another story which I could tell you. Um, so this is the construction of it, nice and easy. The panels, John Young's in there, straight up, straight down the road. All very light brick, you know, brick built. People love them, absolutely love them. We've actually had a non-exec um, board member that lived there, our tenant, one of our tenant board members, and she actually said it makes such a difference to her purse, actually. It was the money saved. It was quite incredible. Uh, it wasn't we did trial some PVs? We were really early adopters then uh, on some of them because um, you know just in case they didn't work, and, uh, <laughs> and that's that's even better. You know that, that you've got the uh, the cost of the kettle as well has come down as well. So that's really cool. So square box, it's worked sitting in Norwich. This is Pavilion Way in East Durham. We continued the SIP theme. I think it was two thousand and eight. Uh, we had an apartment block, went up three full stories, again worked really well, constructed 15 months, 65 properties next to uh, Nether, yeah, Nether School. Uh, shared ownership sales there, so that was the first time we sold something using a SIP panel. They're reselling, which is the key for me. That first market's always easy, it's the second market. NHBC backed, everything's NHBC backed, still performing, and we've got no damn <coughs> mold, it's non-existent in these, so we've just got to try and work out why on what, what's going on. But we, the key to this one, the fun of it, is that we built this sort of arc in sit panels. So it's, it's good. The wood at the top isn't, isn't particularly great. I, I don't like wood, as, as John now knows. Uh, John did design this. And, um, but people love them still. They're really, really good houses. <coughs> uh, but that was sit panels. And the speed, again, I needed because of funding. Homes England were driving that. Um, brick and block, I would never have got there. We'd never have got there in the time scales. But actually the outcome of it, exceptional. This is Formiston, 2014. We'd done a whole load of work in Sweden on Passive House. I took a whole load of contractors and consultants out in 2007, 2008, <coughs> uh, and worked with the Passive House Institute out of there. Um, we can't say that we helped Norwich City Council with Goldsmith Street, but we have been accredited a little bit with that. We got them involved with Passive House at the time. And then I gave the scheme to Orbit, and then they didn't want to do it, and then it all fell over. So that could have been us, guys. That could have been us, that's fairly close. But it wasn't. So there we are. Um, so uh, Formerston was our first passive, and it's been our only passive, which is interesting. Um, we did win a national award with it. Um, it's a lovely scheme in North Norfolk. Timber frame. Uh, we used a Stuart Milne frame. I think that's uh, uh, it's a panelised SIP system, so sorry, it's Stuart, Stuart Milne frame. 
Um, it was quite interesting. We used the little bits with the stuff inside the panel. The what's the stuff? The what's the stuff called? I don't know what it's called. Monster. But yeah, they were all stuck together in the panel. And Stuart Milne didn't put enough sticky stuff in the panel for the insulation. And they, it was like um, Hansel Gretel. The, there was little panels all the way from Oxford. There was this little <laughs> thing that's coming up off the lorry. That frame went up three times to get it right. Uh, we had it drop down twice. It had to go. I'm not going to say who built it. Um, we're going to. Uh, we had to put it up three times. Um, Chopper glass windows were great. They're from Internor. They worked. Came on time, but we're from Austria. But very expensive, as we all know. Uh, first time we put mechanical heat vent heat recovery in. That was a problem um, because somebody hadn't attached it properly in one of the houses, and we wondered why it wasn't working. It, it was all sorts of things. But we were learning, and that was the key for this. We were learning. We only did four. But Hans Eck came across, who invented, I think Hans Eck, is that his name? Who invented Passive House many, many years ago. He came across and visited it <laughs> from Germany. And he said, Andrew, Andrew, why are you making your life so difficult? And I said, why? He said, well, you've built timber. I said, well, isn't that what you're supposed to do? And he said, no, concrete. <laughs> Build it in concrete. And that's really interesting, isn't it? I hate to think where we'll be now. Pacification in Europe, a lot of it. Oh, I did a tour of Austria. It's all concrete. Yeah. It's amazing. But we're trying to timber. More tape in this building than I've ever seen. On a client's perspective, I think I spent more on tape than I did on anything else, to be honest with you. But actually, is it performing? And that's the key. Yes. Exactly the same tenants are in those houses that actually that went in the first let. Their bills are down. There's a few design faults where it's designed rather than the timber frame or the frame itself once we've got it working. Uh, door, we didn't put a window in, so we built a fridge behind it. There was no heat coming in, if that makes sense. It was just a, it was a hallway with nothing, no light in it. So south facing wasn't gaining any solar, solar heat. So that was like a fridge and that was affecting the performance. So we've had to, we've had to go back and sort a few bits and pieces out. But actually, generally, really, really good scheme. Um, now, first foot into the modular world, Copenhagen Way. It's just off Durham Road, uh, where Lidl is, or was. I think there's a gym there now, it's behind a pub. Um, <laughs> when we do things, we don't do things by half. Um, I didn't buy these in a factory in, in the UK. We bought these in a factory in China. Um, fascinating experience. Um, it really was. Structurally, absolutely super. Um, completely over-engineered. It was a British company that, it was a London architect that designed them and just had them made in, in, in um, China. The, um, the, the structure itself, absolutely super. Uh, very few problems now since installation. People are really enjoying living there. They're good space. Um, I didn't see any advantage over the timber frame, I'll be bloody honest. They're steel, these steel frame box. Fully fitted in the factory, which was half our problem. So when you go and buy your first modular, just really sort your quality out. Check your factory. I know we were in China, but we were learned the hard way, big time. Because we came in, and this was my project manager coming down the corridor of the office. So, Vic, what's wrong? So, it's the height of the showers, mate. <laughs> And it was literally like that. Our electrics and circuits we had to rebuild. We actually rebuilt the whole of the internal of these modules because it was awful, absolutely awful. And that's a learning, you know, that's a big, big learning. Quality control, it doesn't matter where you are, be it China, be it in the, in the UK, get somebody in monitoring it. Anyway, really good. So there we are. That's a, oh, God, it's got the contractor on it. Yeah, uh, love all bless their hearts, put, put that up for me. Uh, if I remember, Simon is still hurting from it, and um, I think the guys went bust at the end of it. So, um, yeah, it was an interesting project, but actually, did modular work for us? Yes, it probably did. Okay, we got the internal bits wrong, we got various bits wrong in there, but actually the system itself, getting nine flats into North Norwich like that, very quickly in a very tight site, okay, the truck could get in off, to, off Elsham Road, what am I on doing, road? off Elsham Road, um, it was super actually, and at the time I got it to work viably, so cost effective as well at the time. Um, would I do that again? No, not quite like that. So this is Canary Key. So this is very recent, um, uh, and thank you very much for the award uh, last month. Um, so um, we did we we did this in light gauge steel. Now um, 
It's down by the football club. 323 apartments. They're selling well, as if you saw Tom Amos's LinkedIn this week. Um, it was on time, on budget. We were one floor every two weeks. Uh, city location, tight site. Could have got modular in, but there's a reason why I didn't go that way. Um, 60% built through the pandemic, 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 no supply issues. And actually, I thought about this, and restaurants would actually call this deconstructed modular. Because we're using that steel frame and all the bits and putting it together. So, um, what I, why, why I'm very pleased we didn't go modular, because we could have done. We looked at CLT, <coughs> that was too expensive. Uh, we looked at concrete, didn't want to do that. That's my embodied stuff going in my head, even though I know you can do recycle and everything. I didn't want to do that. Um, timber frame scares me up that high. I still does. I don't know why, but it does for some reason. So light gauge is like a nice little Meccano kit. It's Sigmat frame. Carters have built it incredibly well. Um, didn't do modular, thank God, I think, because of our fire regs changing. I've been thinking about this. Because you're forward funding those modular, I had to forward fund those by some China, which was scary business. Um, because you're forward, forward funding a lot of this in the factories, it's a very different payment pattern. And for someone like us, where we're drawing big lumps of money down, secured against the existing housing stock, it's nice and easy. It's very different from development finance in our private company. Um, so it's nice and easy to be able to pay up front if we needed to, even though it's probably costing us more money to do it. But if we'd done that, I think, and surely costs would probably agree, I've seen a couple of guys here, that all the changes that went on after Grenfell, because we started not far after that, all the fire changes, everything else that we needed to put in, I would have pre-ordered those modular units already. And you already heard from Paul, changing that in the factory is expensive. It's like changing a design and build contract on a site. You never do it because it's expensive. You're going to get hit by it. So, uh, reflecting, Mario, there you go. Reflecting it, on it, I'm really pleased we went light gauge because we were able to make changes as we went, but still got the time. It was no, no, slow, no slower, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so I, I was really pleased we went um, LGS, but I, I, I think um, it was a really good frame. It's been super, and actually air tightness has been. It, it was quite staggering what we achieved by not trying to achieve it. Quite staggering which then gave us other problems. But anyway, um, world of change, I, I thought this was gave us enough flexibility, but also a lot of component parts going on. And that's what it ended up with. Nice design, I think, personally. But, you know, that's uh, really good. my personal opinion. <laughs> you designed it, John. Shush. Um, Webster Court. Alex is still enjoying delivering this scheme. Um, so this was our next Ferrari, Ferrari? <laughs> Ferrari. into uh, Modular. We decided, lockdown one, there was a whole load of money, this is what happens in our sector, the government decides it needs to do something, and what happens is a whole load of money chucks out, and then the sector has to deliver it somehow. Um, what, what happened in lockdown one, of course, is uh, if you probably saw, every, the government decided that everybody that was homeless on the streets needed somewhere to live. If you remember rightly, and this is based on the back of that funding. Um, we had to buy a whole load of flats through um, the pandemic in Norwich to deal with that, but I, I, I also wanted to buy and uh, build new stuff. It's so much better because it just gives us asset management problems in the future on the other stuff. I don't like doing it. So, how do you do it? Well, I thought let's do it quickly. Money had to be spent, we'll go modular. That's a factory, clean environment. Lovely place to work. Heavily engineered, I think. But that's, that's what it was inside. So, <laughs> I really question the way, and I'm going to be a bit outspoken now. I'm going to really question the way that modular industry operates. I've had to take the words off the screen because Alex wouldn't let me put them on, but I still felt, I thought they'd moved on seven years. You know, we, we went out to a whole load of people. Um, when we did the one in Copenhagen way before we went to China. Um, and it felt really, it doesn't matter who you went to, it felt really shed-like with a phone and a dog. It, it was really odd. They, it's like the industry hasn't moved on at all. The way they operate in that industry 
was incredibly backward to me again. It wasn't smooth. I expected smooth supply. It wasn't. We had brick slips stuck in an Italian port. Why buy them in Italy? I was just crazy in the pandemic. There was no thought of process. There was all sorts of things. And we built a whole block of Canary Key and L L L L LSG, LGS, um, in the time that we delivered nine pods or nine flats. That was three days on site, 15 months, 16 months to get them there. It was just unbelievable um, and expensive. They weren't cheap. Viability wise, if I hadn't got that money from government, <coughs> FW, you wouldn't have done it. It wouldn't have added up. So I'm not, still not sure why it costs more when everyone talks about efficiency in a factory. We've had quotes after that on three other sites, which we've gone timber frame, which we've completed as well, that were cheaper, which gave me all the same benefits, all the same timescales, and, uh, and I don't know what's going on. And that certainty of products is maybe one of them. They can't get the certainty through the factory, but something is going wrong, and I wish I knew wrong. I wish I, 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 wish I knew why. But we've tried, we've tried again. But I, I, we really don't understand. And also, investments away from Norfolk, which is one of our key things that we're trying to invest here. We spent £32 million in Norfolk last year, and that's important to us, really important. So this is, um, oh, this is I don't know if that's going to work. So the next stage, so that's Webster Call, um, a modular. Interesting experience again. So our next stage was, we had to look back. I had this hammock moment in... Um, as I talked about in lockdown one. So why are we not at net zero? We, we were ready in 2016. This is ridiculous, operationally wise. We've got to think about embodied. And we had a quick embodied survey done on a brick and block build we were building, just finishing in Great Hockham, um, down in Breckland. And actually, that, everything was pointing us back to timber frame. And it was pointing us back to timber frame because we've got certain design that we like to use. We, we, we've got standardization but it's not standard we never will be standard I, this thing in me that keeps saying we're going to be completely standardized we never are we're a house you know in the end we are a developer like anybody else we develop open market housing we we look at that site and say why we don't want that design on there do we how do i standardize so we can standardize floor plates to a point but even then they're getting judged do we need office space in this <coughs> one? do we need this in this one do we need that one you're never going to get to our size, Persimmon might be able to, people like that might be able to, but our size, we cannot. We build 30 to 40 open markets a year, 100, 150 affordables a year. And, and we just can't, we, we, we never have quite got there. Um, so we went looking, we went looking for a timber frame, and we'd heard of timber frame management who are <coughs> based in Kings Lynn, they're on Hardwick Industrial Estate, been there 20 years. Um, same time I've been at Bourbon, never heard of them. But they were building the site at Kringleford on the roundabout, the one that's gone up there. And um, we heard they'd been really good through the market. So we went to see them, and David, who owns it, is incredibly, I mean, John Smith's here, you've uh, bought off them. Um, they, um, they're they incredibly, incredibly enthusiastic about their products. And we've now developed something with them to go net zero. So we've developed something, a, a frame with them in Norfolk that I can get supply off and, uh, and it's small enough that we can get the volume through. We're not big enough to get complete volume, so you can hell on putting a sales routine on here. But they've worked with us, they've now got the turning tables in, they were stick and, you know, they were stick frame basically boys really. And they've worked with us and they're, they're now panelised panels. So we're, we, we, we're really pleased that we've been able to do that in Norfolk with an existing company. We're not setting up somebody else. We're not setting up another company in Norfolk. Actually investing here. So um, it's really exciting and worth giving them a call. Chris, the technical director, though, is incredibly good. Incredibly good. And they've done market stuff. They've done everything. And if you're thinking about your embodied carbon, whatever you think about brick and block and how close it is to steel, timber we've seen is, is where we've got to go. That's one of those um, one of those drivers where I talked about we're talking about low carbon now. We've got to go there. We feel so. We've done North Reps. So this is timber frame going up. Blah, blah, blah. So this is North Reps in North Norfolk. We've just started it, um, and this is what they look like. 
you know, if you'd like the chimney stack or not, it's another matter. It doesn't work, by the way, it's just there, which has come <laughs> off the next ones, so don't worry. Um, but it's a standard flint tile brick house, and actually we're doing it in a Norfolk frame. It's, it's, it's got a roof full of uh, uh, PEV going on top. We're net zero operational, we will be net zero operational, and now we're pulling down our embodied carbon. So we've done a study on our last brick and block in Great Hockham, and MMC, if you want to call it that, Timber Frame is helping us to get there. It's giving us the speed on site, I want to hit the market next spring, it's giving me the speed on site, we're seeing our customers are actually saying, we don't, we don't mind this Timber Frame. You know, we're not worried. What we're worried about is the cost of running our house. That's what we're running, worried about now. We're worried about the carbon in our house as well. We understand what that is. You're starting to explain it to us. And so are we. We're really worried about it. And actually, if people don't lift their heads up and keep doing what they're doing, we're never going to get there. We're never going to help this planet. So I know that's my soapbox bit, but I really believe in this big time. But, but Andrew, your bill costs are no less, are they? No. You just save time, that's all about building. Yeah. But yeah, and all this thing about getting your rent in quickly for us and things, and I ignore it because you don't really. So I'm saving time. I've got the roof on before you know it. So your brick and block's still going up while I've got the roof on, and I'm getting my internals done while the outside's going up. Um, um, we don't have the flappy insulation in the rain anymore. We saw that at Grey Hockham. Alex and I were down there one day after being in the factory in Kings Lynn looking at the bloke in the rain trying to put the insulation in the cavity soaking wet and it happens it happens but here we're not we're covered we're in roofs on done and and, and actually i forgot about we've done kets hill there's some a new terrace on the bottom of kets hill that was us that was the same frame we just done one in thetford as well and we've done that quicker than we do with the modular which is really interesting i'm not saying modular is a bad thing by the way don't get me on but our experience has shown that the market isn't there yet for us to get the speed that people are talking about. It doesn't make any difference, really. Our rents are so low, Julian, it doesn't help with viability. It's more to go quicker. Well, it's when you're on site, because it sorry, took it's three days. It's more cheaper. No. Are you on the mass bit? No. no modular no. can't, modular can't no. be cheaper. It won't, it won't get no. Even on the big one? Even on the big one. Okay. You, you've got to bear in mind, any off-site process you're taking all the materials that would go directly to your site yeah. and you're taking them to another location, heating, lighting, staff, and you're taking off a lorry and you're building it into big lamps and you're putting it back on the lorry and you're transporting it. You're adding costs to that process. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I just don't know why, Jim, because there should be efficiencies in that factory building, so I don't understand. He challenges Jack all the time and he says exactly the same thing. Yeah, well, well Jack's right because he's, 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 he's talked to Alex, hasn't yeah. he? So he's yeah. right. Yeah. Right, so summary of thoughts. <laughs> summary of thoughts, and then I can let you go. Sorry, it's five past eight. I apologise. Um, so, we talk which frame for project, not that it's MMC, and we don't really talk MMC. Those words, those letters don't come into our vocabulary. It's about your, what you're going to build with. We've got such a wide range of stakeholders, strategies trying to influence, and I know about planning and everything else, but there's so many people having their voice about this. You've just got to keep remembering your strategy. Don't forget it, because otherwise, you won't get anywhere with it. You will just keep changing your mind. and You've just got to keep it with it. That's something I've learned in my old age. Um, we like flexibility in design. Modular doesn't give that. that. That's the thing. Modular should give us speed. We haven't seen that either. It should give us quality. We haven't necessarily seen that either. But we, we like the flexibility in design. And, and actually, that gives us timber frame, <coughs> which is a part of that panel system, could do that still. Um, Currently, the frame for us is centre of a wider strategy. It's not just about, oh, am I using MMC? It's what's coming on. So that carbon world is coming in and driving us that way as well. So there is a wider strategy that we're dealing with. And we're trying to now bring together supply chains. So we've got a, a window that we have developing, hopefully with Drayton at the moment. So that's pretty cool. Uh, triple glaze here in Nor Norfolk. And that's what we're going to continue to do. We're going to continue to try and get the supply chain in here, we're only going to spend 20 million this year in Norfolk because of whatever economic world it is, but actually that's an awful lot of money to invest in Norfolk and I don't want it going out. So that's really crucial for us and if I can, if you go into this sort of stuff and you're looking at, you're working out the parts, try your local supply chain. We've got recycled aggregate companies here, we've got 
amazing people I met at the IOD thing the other night who's just got, he's got a heap of stuff in there that I'm going to go and see him at the end of the month, which I'll tell you about at some point if I can work out what he's doing. But there's some very, very clever people here. Um, very clever, clever people. Now, this kit of parts, which keeps being heard about, there's a company called Modulus that's been um, started to <coughs> promote this. And this, this, this is basically, I think, where we're probably going, where we've got that standardised kit of what we're building with. It doesn't mean it, it could be a square, it could be a rectangle, it could be a circle, whatever it is, it builds. But we've got our standardised kit, we've got the technology behind it, they've got some technology that allows the designers to pick those kits of parts off and then design them out. I can see us going there, it's like BIM on steroids a little bit, I suppose. Um, integrated supply chain, so we've got our supply chains, we know where we're going with it, and we're working that out at the moment. And then we build it here, now that might be... You know, uh, a company here that's been trying that in Norwich, isn't there? Which, you know, that local assembly thing, which I, I've always believed in local assembly, it's just how you do it. But I actually do think doing it on site, if you've got your kit of parts and you get as much done in the factory as possible, and then just build it on site. And then it's high, high speed installation then. You've got everything in order for what you're doing. And I think that's where we've got to go. It's that kit of parts for whichever organisation you are, or contractor or whatever. Um, that, that will get us in the future. So personally, never known so many agendas in my life in terms of development. I, I've never known a planning system in the way it is. Nutrient, I mean, gosh, I thought I might as well say that word because it normally comes up. You know, the, the amount of things that's been thrown at us at the moment, including this, but actually I think this is one we can sort out. I think this is one that we can deal with. You've just got to have your own strategy. And viability, I was going to pick that because you love that word, Julian, I know. Mm. Is, is a problem now and will be a problem for all our tenures in the future. I mean, I, I was sat here at the uh, thing that you did with the contractor survey, listening to contractors and people, consultants. Clients don't know this and clients don't know that. I didn't say anything that night. But actually, viability guys, your client might be going a bit like this. Can you get that? Can you get that cheaper? It's a problem. <laughs> it's a serious problem. And we've got an industry that actually is in a worse state than we think it is because we can't get our appraisals and we've got a black art. We have a black art form, really, to get our appraisals to work. People don't quite understand how I built Canary Key, but in terms of funding it. But if we're having problems where we've got little pockets of things that we can find, I don't know what the house builders, the small house builders are finding. It's tough. It's very, very tough and it's on its way. So. We're trying to find that efficiency in our frame, the way, we've been, the way we're developing with a local company to make sure that we can sort of counteract that viability in the future. And with Future Homes going, we're, still, we're already there, so Future Homes 25, we've got all your net zero stuff on top of it. You've got to find a way of doing it. And I think the only way to do it is to do it at home. All right? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just a couple of a couple of club matters to try and pick up on. Um, so our next next event, uh, East Coast Focus with Wayne Hemingway. So that wasn't advertised on the website, but so we're delighted that Wayne Hemingway is able to come along and talk to us. For those of you who've not heard him speak, you should. Uh, for those of you who heard him speak, you should listen again. Really engaging speaker, quite controversial. For those of you who have heard him, um, a bit of a coup for us to be able to get him to come and talk to the club. Thank you to Michelle and Jim McFarland for the for setting that up. Really good uh, event for us. It will be here. Um, we're going to get the tickets uh, available soon. Please make sure if you book a ticket, you're going to come. So if we get 25% get of the people who say they're going to come, like Hampton tonight, don't come. For a maiden speaker like him, we're going to pay to come. That would be really embarrassing. So please make sure we spread the word that if you're going to come, do make the effort to get here. That would be really good. So, do we not pay Andrew and Paul? No, I was going to say. Um, I got Dylan. paid. Quite a lot, <laughs> 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 I'm going to pay them both verbal flats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, he's a really good speaker. So do make the effort to get along to that one. Uh, we talked a lot about the format, but we decided in the end to keep it simple and keep it here. Um, it's a good location and having a nice forum and people to listen to Wayne do his thing would be really great. Uh, we then got some party coming up at the Georgian Hat Townhouse on the 13th of July. It's not a lecture based thing, it's a networking based thing, so it's a way of saying uh, thank you for your attendance for the last year, going along to our events, should be a really good thing. Last year was really successful, um, uh, so we're going to repeat that again for this year. Uh, what else have we got? I didn't do this, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of winging it as we go along. What's great to look at this picture is how happy the people look, how amazed and startled and and shocked and all kinds of things. 
Um, so the events uh, late, uh, late last month were really good, thanks to all those people who, who bought tickets and came and drank and enjoyed the event. We helped to raise over two grand, two grand for charity, that was really good. Um, we've had some feedback on the event as well, which we've taken on board as a committee. Lots of lessons to be learned about that thing. Each time we do it, we'll do it better next year. And we really know what's wrong with this particular picture. I don't think you to draw it out, but I think one of the issues we've got to try and address in the next year is about why this is wrong. So, um, really big focus for us. So we're doing a lot of work, but thank you to everybody who got involved in that. that event. It was really good. We know there were things that the ladies' toilet smelled up at one point, and the food was a bit late. But there are lots of formatting things you want to try and get right. Particularly, the thing we want to get right as well is about the, the dwell a bit longer on the actual uh, the submissions and the awards and why people won. That's the bit we want to try and linger on more next year. So we'll be putting some more feedback about how that how it all went. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, so that's it. So really, just to conclude, thanks to thanks to Better Building Delivery, to, to Paul and to Andrew for their contribution tonight. Really excellent speakers, and thank you so much for your time and energy put into the event as always. And for those of you who are interested, not feeling slightly soporific and, and looking to get home for their for their dinner, um, some of us going to the coach and horses. Everybody's always always welcome to join that for the sort of after party thing. I'll be there. Um, thanks very much for coming again, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. <laughs>